Sylvia and Julian were here at the beginning, her husband, Julian, they established the Craft Guild almost 65 years ago. So she's, so she's a primo member of the Guild. She, she should get the uh, trophy. Um, so I just wanna say Sylvia do, has, done, has done so many different kinds of artwork, so many me media. She has taught, she'll talk about all that. But I just, I just had to say that she's been such an inspiration to me and, and such an, inc an encourager and a nurturer and uh, just, just one of the wonderful art mothers that I've had in the, in the Craft Guild uh, in my 40, 42, almost 43 years of being in the Craft Guild. So thank you so much, Sylvia, and uh, do it. Do it. I can't wait to hear it. Nancy, thank you so much for inviting me and for encouraging me and telling me it's gonna be good. <laughs> and always being there is such a good friend. I need a good friend and I have one in you. I am a, an artist who has worked in many mediums, including colored pencils, printmaking, pulp, paper pulp, fiber arts, and enameling. But you're not gonna to have to see all of it. So don't worry about that. <laughs> I was, yes, I, I was an early member of the Guild, but actually my husband Julian was one of the founders. At the time I was painting and sketching and not doing crafts, but he was doing jewelry and ceramics. And he saw this ad in the paper that said that a couple of people wanted to get together to form some group. And this, when we first moved here, this was a cultural desert. So this was so exciting that this was a possibility. And it's still exciting. By the time the Craft Skill had its first exhibit at Macy's, I made a fabric applique and I got accepted. So I was so excited. Now I'm a craft person. These are pictures of me getting an award and giving a demonstration for the Craft Skill. I think that was at Nassau Community College. And I was able to demonstrate printmaking to them. Don't I look young there? <laughs> this is a little bit out of order, but I'll take it anyway. This is a picture I painted of my father when I was about 10. He was a tailor and I painted it on canvas board. Many of my drawings and paintings at that time were done on paper bags. A little bit of history. I was born in East Harlem and moved to the Bronx when I was five. I was the youngest of four children, and my two older brothers and, sisters were, and sister were all interested in the arts and were a great influence on me, or to me. Which one is it? <laughs> my family was poor, but rich in cultural interests. I don't know if I was especially talented as a child, but I was exposed to art and encouraged and supported by my family to make art. My brother, Ben, who was 10 years older than I, took me to the Metropolitan Museum of Art when I was, where I was introduced to paintings and sculptures. I was fascinated with Rembrandt painting, and I remember crying and saying, why does such a great artist have to die? During the Depression, my brother, Ben, worked at a community art center which is part of President Roosevelt's New Deal National Youth Ad Administration program. He became, he became friends with the art director there and kept bringing my drawings to the art director. That was my first art lesson. He brought them to the, to the director and he returned it with written suggestions and critiques. This was my start of my art education and for which I was so grateful. My brother Irving worked in a print shop during the day and went to school at high, at, to high school at night in order to help the family financially. With some of his earnings, he bought me pastels and other art supplies. He also sold some of my drawings to a woman who worked in the shop with him. I didn't even have to give a commission or anything like that. As a high school student in New York City, I was especially privileged to go to the High School of Music and Art. When a teacher at the school complimented my work, I came home singing, I'm going to be an artist, I'm going to be an artist. I became friends with the students, with students with similar interests 
And we spent weekends going to galleries and museums. And you could take the subway, you didn't need a car or anything. After high school, I went to the Fashion Institute of Technology to study textile design. I really didn't know what I wanted to do, but that's what my friend was doing it, so I followed her. At that time, FIT was a two-year college located on the top uh, two floors of a high school. I think that the most important thing I learned at FIT is how to look for design possibilities in the visual world around me. For several years, I worked in studios as a colorist, repeat artist, and designer. This is a this is a picture. This is a picture of my a dress my father made for me using silk material printed with one of my textile designs. I tried to put it on the other day, but it's really too small. <laughs> when Julian and I moved to Long Island, I decided to make a career change. I got my teaching degree in art education and was an art teacher in several school districts. And later on, after I retired from that, I was an adjunct professor at Nassau Community and CW Post. I was introduced to printmaking. This, this is my wonderful press. I was introduced to printmaking through a workshop given by the Art Teachers Association with Jimmy DiNicola. I think Jimmy then joined our craft school. I went, I went on to study printmaking while getting my master's degree at Adelphi. After completing my degree, I got, print, I got a printing press and it changed my life. For me, the exciting part of printmaking is the unlimited potential for experimentation. I will start by showing my etchings and aquatints and then move on to collagraphs. We're starting with etchings. A Moment of Beauty, that's what the name of this one is, is printed from images on two zinc plates. That's what I print with. One small round one inserted into a longer large plate. The space in between the plate creates a white embossment. My love of nature and flowers was my inspiration for this etching. This is hanging in my living room. It's called Tide Pools. The etch this etching represents memories of exploring tide pools in Maine, of looking below, above, and around the tide pool to see what creatures I could find. This is called Cracks, Crevices, and Textures. The idea for this came from a design I saw in the way pebbles, rocks, soil, and debris were arranged in the cracks and crevices of a broken pavement. I'm always looking someplace. <laughs> this is called Free Association. This abstract composition re represents a state of mind and is composed of several zinc plates printed together at the same time. I'm getting to see all my work myself. <laughs> this is called English Countryside. This is an etching of the beautiful landscape I saw when traveling in England. And the, this is the this is the plate that went that produced this print. So there are three plates all together. These the two plates here fit into the circles, and I. I ink them and then print them at the same time. This is called a Peruvian textile. I'm influenced and inspired by the strong design and sense of mystery I find in the art, masks, and textiles of other cultures, Africa and Peru in particular. This is called No Escape. This piece is inspired from a photograph my daughter Ronnie took of fire escapes. This brings back memories of trying to escape the feeling of being trapped in a stifling hot apartment in my childhood. We sought relief by, from the heat by sleeping on the fire escape. You think we got sleep? <laughs> this is called haunting memories. I hope I'm not making everybody depressed. <laughs> when I made this print, I was thinking of stories told to me by my parents of the pogroms faced by Jewish people in Russia and Romania. That's where they came from. This is a little difficult to see the embossments, but all around the center etching, there are embossed faces. 
uh, I'm sorry that you can't see it, but anyway, the reason I started doing abortion is I wanted to, to create a sense of depth in my pictures and I kept going on and on. Okay, this is, I'm gonna read it to you, oh, I'm gonna sell it to you. This is called The Me Nobody Knows. That's, that's my faces. This is a print made from com a combination of an embossment of mask-like faces and etching. I wanted to achieve more dimension by doing the embossment. I often impose images upon images to create a sense of multi-level feelings, if you know what that means. This is another kind of print. It's not made on a zinc plate, and I'll explain it. I started making calligraph prints to, again, to achieve more depth to my work, more dimension. This piece reflects my concern about social justice issues. I made this print as a reaction to an incident that took place on the campus of Kent State University on May 4th, 1970. The Ohio National Guard fired into a group of students protesting the Vietnam War, which resulted in the killing of four students and wounding of nine more. This is a calligraph printing plate. A calligraph plate is a thick collage, which results in a print in relief, this plate is made on a base of Mac board and with varied materials, sandpaper, cardboard, and other textured materials glued onto the base. This achieves a variety of tones and more dimensions. Included in this plate are small etching plates with more precise images. I can get more lines and drawings into that. And I don't think this is such a good picture of the plate though. Okay. Okay, thank you. Another calligraph. It's called Cotswold Village. The calligraph print is of the English countryside. There's an etching of tall grasses printed on top of it. There's another calligraph. This time it's a round one. It's showing a section of all kinds of textures around it. And it's called the turquoise bird. My daughter Judy liked this, so she wanted me to include it. <laughs> Paper, pulp, and citrus. To make the next few images I will show you, I bought large amounts of paper pulp made from cotton lenses from a studio in New York City. I separated the pulp into pails and dyed them with Procyon dyes. I used my blender to make new colors. And you should have seen the pails. There were big pails in a small room. I was sort of wandering around, hoping I didn't spill anything. Okay, so this, this picture is made of paper pulp. And I'll describe how I made it. I used small wet pieces of pulp. I used tweezers to lift and place the pulp onto a piece of plexiglass. The plexiglass is standing over a drawing I made in color and is transparent so I can see where to place the pulp. I use a sponge to squeeze out the water, to squeeze the water out of the pump, which compresses it. After a week or so it dries and I remove it from the plexiglass. This is now a sheet of paper with rough, bubbly surface. I create lines and textures onto it by sewing it with colored threads of various thicknesses. The next few pieces are made with paper pulp and citrary. So I'm using, uh, I'm not gonna give you as long a detail about how to do it, but I hope you like it. Paper pulp and it's called waves. And this one, after I finished the whole thing, I thought it needed something more, so I cut it in sections and sort of made it a more interesting composition. I spent lots of time in Maine, so many summers, looking at wonderful scenery, and then make sketches of it, and then some of it gets turned into paper pieces or it prints. So this is called tall grasses.
This is called Patchwork. And it's sort of an abstracted picture of the fields of, that you will find in farmlands. And I just like the way the patterns work. So I also included little details of what might be growing there. Monhegan Meadows, another paper piece with lots of stitchery. I used to spend summers, a su couple of summers, in Monhegan Island. I don't know if any of you have ever gone there, but it's a wonderful place to go. There's nothing to do but to paint, draw, and hike. Scenery is great. And you're very far from any place, but you feel so close to people there because they're all doing the same thing you're doing. This was in the last show that we had. It's called Southwest Vista. It's also paper pieces and a lot of stitchery. Magical Fields of Maine. You can see I was influenced by Maine. Same way, paper pulp and made from a drawing that I had done with colored pencils and then a stitchery. And the citry helps me to make the lines and the textures that I'm trying to achieve. This is an abstract composition. I don't know what to call it, <laughs> but I was thinking maybe call it Find Me, but it has a lot of threads covering the paper. I kind of like the design of it. Next pieces are paper as assemblages. This piece is called hide and seek and i made this at haystack school of crafts in maine it was the first time i took a paper making class i used a different method a mold and decal to make the shape paper and then just arrange it and of course there are the shells and pebbles that were there This is a wall hanging made with cast paper. A friend of mine gave me swatches of fabric and she said, I don't care what you make, but I know it's gonna be good. I want you to make a piece for me. So just try to use the colors that I'm giving you. So I use clay in order to get the three dimensional feeling, uh, I keep pointing the three dimensional feelings of the shape. I had to build forms. I use clay and plaster of Paris to make my mold and then cast my paper in the mold to make my three-dimensional shapes and then of course arrange it. And of course there's always something hidden in there. I'm always hiding something. <laughs> this piece was made using the same method as the previous piece and I used some some of the uh, leftover forms to make it. And it was a wedding gift to one of my daughter's good friend who is now my good friend. If you come visit me, this is hanging in, on my wall in the living room. It's called Between the Layers. This is made with cast paper with inserted pebbles and shells. These pieces all were inspired by my summer spent on the coastal areas of Maine. Okay, we're up to another, another category, fibers and citrary. Hey, that's a beautiful color. The, the pieces that I'm gonna show you under fibers and, and fabric are all different methods. So I have like one in one method and two in another. Um, this landscape was made by painting with fabric paint on muslin. I added lines and textures with citrary. And the citrary is done by hand, of course, because I don't really know how to use a machine. This is another uh, landscape on, on fabric. I didn't realize it was going to come up here. Mm -hmm. And I... There are little scenes of vistas that I've seen in my travels. Or, and we have done, we did do a lot of going out to places where it's beautiful. 
So this is also done with fabric paint. And, and I use stitchery for the lines and details. I like the, I like the photographs better than my pictures. <laughs> okay. All right, on to another way of working. This is what I call soft sculpture. I don't know what to call it, but it is made with cotton fabric, which has been appliqued, stitched, and playfully hung. This represents the public and private faces women project. I call this a totem. The wall hanging is made with a hook rug technique sewn around the handle of a shovel. This is a batik scarf. This one was one of many batik scarves that I made with Procyon dyes and hot wax, melted hot wax. I was inspired by my friend Harriet Burke, a guild member who was making beautiful batik clothing at that time. Thank you, Harriet. <laughs> These next pictures are some of the tools I use and supplies I use. These rollers were used to roll on printer's ink onto the surface of my many printing plates. These are etching needles, palette knives, and all kinds of, yeah, other kinds of needles that I use as spatulas to use to mix the paint and to take the etching needles to take off the ground from the plate so that it, the ground, so that the plate is exposed to the acid. These are my princess inks. They are oil-based. And today there are new methods of printing with water-based inks that are much safer and the class is available to take them. Oh, I, this blender. This is what I mix some of my paper pulp with in order to make new colors. It's amazing. You can take a, a, a pink or a blue and mix it with a white and make it light. It's just like mixing with paints. It's so exciting. Oh, I'm back to my father's the yeah. painting of my father. Okay. So when um, I was, You want to say something about it? Should I say anything more about it? I think I, don't, I think I was must have been around ten when I did that, and I had the privilege of using a canvas board, which I hadn't had before. And I'm, a, I'm a, my daughter found it <clears throat> looking through boxes. You might have to put this in the talk. And we've come full circle. Yeah. Nancy Oshi, Nancy Ole, Ronnie and Judy, Lisa and Susan, Sylvia's aides and friend, Alice Princer. Nancy R. Yoshi encourages an old friend. So many other friends called me to wish me good luck when I was at the fair the other day. People came over to me and said, I'm going to listen to you. Good luck. So I always really appreciate so much the support and love the people in the craft school give me. Thank you again. Thank you, Sylvia. You're welcome. Would we would we like to have a, um, a a question and answer session now, Sylvia? What kind of thread do you use on your stitchery pieces? Any kind, <laughs> thick or thin. And if I want a thicker line, I'll use a thicker piece of thread. Or, and if I want, and then I have all kinds of colors. But it, I'm not really particular about it as long as I get the effect that I want. Is, is is do you get the effects by like pulling it tighter and 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 like creating a uh, like a I don't know like like quilting kind of yes sometimes I do that also uh, with the the one the, with the pictures that I did of the fabric on the the landscapes behind it I put some um what are you quilting quilting like batting batting yeah I couldn't think of the word batting and and then wrap it around a uh, foam core. Yeah. Any other questions? I wonder, Sylvia, when you're doing the stitchery, if you think of your father, the tailor. <laughs> well, 
Not really, but I think that my father was much more talented than I realized because he used to make uh, he used to make little um, what do you call it? appliques. I have some pillows that he made with little animals that he invented. Oh, yeah. And I remember the taking him to a museum which he had hadn't gone to except the Museum of the City in New York, and he saw some abstract paintings. And he loved it. And I was so surprised. How could he appreciate it? But he did. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, it is. I have a question. I was going to ask Amy's question, but um, <laughs> you you moved from so many different mediums. And I think I have some sense of your training, but I think I don't have a full sense of your training. And I'm curious like what would motivate you to move from etching to holograph or what motivated you to move from holographs or prints to the work that you did in paper? Like, and, I, and then how did you train yourself? Cause you didn't really have a background in that I'm assuming. Well, I took workshops for one thing in paper making that helped me. Um, I learned from other people, you know, other artists share uh, share their work with me, and um, my I think what was happening is um, as I'm talking and as I watch my own uh, development here, I kept wanting to make my pictures more dimensional. So I went from the etching to the um, embossment, which made it a little higher, and then I went on to do the paper pulp pictures which gave it a more of a texture and a little more sense of relief and the color grass of course you can create the very deep pictures if you if you uh, if you don't want to break your press you better be careful how you do it but you can do it so and as I needed it that's what you do when you want to learn something and you get to the point you say oh I need to learn this in order to get to what I want to do and take a workshop if I can, or read about it. Now you can get on on the, the computer and it tells you everything. <laughs> you can come to the craft guild and learn it from other people in the guild. Absolutely. That's what I'm trying to, Quinn used to do ceramics and I'm trying to convince him to come and take some ceramics here. Okay, Sylvia, oh. out of all the oh. beautiful pieces that you have made, what is your favorite that you showed us? <laughs> oh, I don't think I have a favorite. I have some that I'm, I like better than others, but I don't have one favorite. Well, they're all beautiful. Thank you so much. That, that's Susan. She's one of my helpers, another promoter. <laughs> uh, how did you cut the circles in your copper plate so accurately? Okay. The truth is that Julian did it for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, how did he do it? <laughs> You don't know? <laughs> oh, jewelry yeah, of course he did it with a jewelry tool. Yeah. I guess he had to start with a, making a hole in the to start with to get the soil in, right? I don't know, I'm not, I don't know. I don't know either. But all the, but all the, but all the pieces of metal that I did have shaped, he cut for me. Uh-huh. He also did the matting on my friend, on my pictures. I enjoy so much your work. It's so it's so easy. It's such a it's so nice for the eyes. It's just easy to look at, and um, just very pleasing, very delightful. Thank you. You know, in going with, by going to take the uh, textile design, it really taught me. I, you know, I, it wasn't as if the people there weren't the kind of artists that I had at music and art, but they were there to try to earn, find a way to earn a living. And the, the school taught us how to look at things and turn it into prints, how to turn it in. And you know, the prints were, we didn't print on the fabric, we just made it on paper. And then the uh, designs went to a mill where they printed it on the fabric. Did I answer your question? I don't think so. I want to say thank you for having me, um, Mr. Nancy, and I'm so happy, and I enjoy your work, Mrs. Sylvia. You are a great artist, and I see all your artwork, very creative, Mr. 
they we are identical, identical, and I love them like the original. And my question is, uh, what the last time it took you to make an album? Which which one? Any of them? Well, you know. the ones with the paper. Yes. I could start it and then stop it for a little while and put it. It would take about two weeks okay. to finish it. Yeah, but the etchings, the etchings could take a long time depending on how they come out. I, I make the first print and then I see what I need to add to it and then I keep doing it till I say, oh, I think it's finished. Oh, <laughs> and nice. then you have to print them. That takes a while too. Oh, yes, that takes. Time. I haven't met you before. Nice to meet mm -hmm. you. Oh, nice to meet you too. I'm looking forward to seeing your work. Sylvia, this was fabulous. You're a real pro at this, at this, at speaking. And Are you, you kidding? <laughs> um, and also, such a wonderful person and such an inspiration. For, I've known you for many years. <laughs> and I'm so glad that I know you for so many years. Such good mm -hmm. friends. You were a teacher. And right. I was wondering how your teaching influenced your work. And how your work influenced your teaching. In order to teach, you had to produce things to show to the students. So that, that got me into all kinds of materials that I might ne never have gotten into. So that was a big help. Um, but sometimes <laughs> teaching junior high school was not such a big help. <laughs> the, the kids were fine, but some of them were difficult. You, you, you didn't talk much about your teaching because I, I know that you, uh, didn't you supervise teachers at, at, at one of the colleges and everything? Yes, I did. Post, through CW Post. When I retired from teaching, I was not ready to retire. So I'd look for a, a job in a college and uh, I got one at Nassau Community and the one at Post was supervising student teachers. And that was, I liked that a lot. And it was much easier to tell someone else what to do <laughs> than to do it yourself. <laughs> but uh, students were very receptive and interested in, in any help they could get. So I love that, yeah. Where, where, where did you teach uh, kids? Uh, first, I taught around here in Island Trees. That was elementary school. Then I taught junior high and some high school at Syasset School District. So so how long was your teaching career? About 25 years. Wow. 25 years in the public schools and then an, another 10 years, you know, wow. as an adjunct. Sylvia, uh, being a creative couple, you and Julian, what was the dynamic between you? Did you critique each other's work? Did you help each other? Did you, or compliments or criticize, criticism or honest feedback or how did, how did that work for you? It worked wonderfully. I know that there are some couples who are, who are, both of them are artists and they compete, but we never competed. And if I won an award, he'd be standing outside the door with a sign. And I got out of the car to sign, you won. <laughs> so that was helpful. I told you that he did cut the plates for me that I needed to be cut and he helped me with the mats. And I would look at the jewelry he was making and telling him where I thought he should change it. And it went according to what he, you know, what he thought was best. But it was a good, that was a really good working relationship. And then we went out so many places to take workshops. I'm lucky that someone else you know, they wanted to take a workshop. So he would take glass and I would take uh, painting on fabric or paper making. And the first time we went to Haystack, I was very disappointed because I was going to continue taking a printmaking class. Only the teacher who was teaching it didn't know very much about printmaking and they hadn't gotten the supplies. But while we were waiting for the supplies, I took walks around the area. And it was so beautiful, the field. And so I fell in love with the area and that spot. And then I went back to Haystack because they, it was really a wonderful place to be, even if they weren't always prepared. This was delightful. And I'm really um, 
so excited about how you kept experimenting and you experimented with forms and also with materials. And it, it really is very exciting to see. And I wonder how you, um, how you use your, or how you absorb that point of view in your training as a textile person early on, because there seems to be a relationship to taking some chances and experimenting. No, I, I don't think I did that so much from my textile design. I think I did it from looking at the people around me in the craft skill and all the wow. things that they did and what was possible. And then also teaching, I needed to try different things to show the students. And I know you're doing that with my daughter's right. class. Right, class. <laughs> right, right. So anyway, I, it, she brings me reports about your classes all the time and it's very yeah. exciting to me that she goes to you. Or well, that's too bad that you're not having the classes now except online, but you'll get there. Well, we're a hybrid. <laughs> <laughs> But your experimentation through all the work from the different kinds of printmaking to the um, paper pulp to introducing sewing. So the sewing and the paper pulp came from the craft guild. Is no, no. I took some, I took a workshop. Workshop. Yeah. I and also saw examples of it, so I knew that that's the direction I wanted to go in. That's, you know. And I've also taken workshops at Haystack. And it, oh. is, it is a magical place. Right. And I also went to music and art. So we have a, oh, lot, you of, did. Okay. We have a lot of connections. <laughs> oh, okay. That we didn't know about. Oh, that's but great. It was wonderful, Sylvia. It was wonderful and such strong work. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Throughout. Anyway, music and art was, I think I was so fortunate to be able to go there. It's I just, was too. I was too. I don't know if it's as good now, but when I was there, it was just music and art. It wasn't where it is now. I'm much older than you, so. Well, uh -huh. And they combined now with a performing arts high school. Right. So it's both. Right. And I also grew up in the Bronx. Where did you grow up? In the, the West Bronx. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll talk later. Okay. <laughs> That's funny. All but right. it was wonderful to see your work, Sylvia. Oh, thank you so much. You make me feel yeah. so good. <laughs> Carol, do you have a question? Yeah, I was curious. Sylvia, you talked about um, when you were looking at some of the work that was based in paper, which I had never seen that looked very sculptural, sculptural, um, about hiding and exploring hiding. And I wondered if you could talk, you said that, right? <laughs> I yeah. wonder if you could talk a little bit more about that. I thought that was really fascinating. I'm not sure. You mean when I was looking at the tide pools? No, it was after the tide pools. It was the it was the paper that looked sort of cylindrical almost, and oh. then there were things hidden inside of it. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. Always, you always had something hidden. Yeah. Well, I always. I don't know, when I'm up in Maine, as you know, because you've been up there, there's so many little crevices and cracks that you find things in and I always feel like I'm finding a treasure. So I wanted that feeling in my work. And so when I made the pieces that I made, I made it so that it would hold my shells and pebbles and things like that and keep me in, in nature all the time. That's so cool. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you, yeah, and you, Sylvia, you, you didn't even talk about enameling. That's another thing that you did. I know. It's too. I, I thought I put too much in it, so I was afraid to put another thing in another time. 
Uh, the mm -hmm. thing that I always felt bad about is that I discouraged you by showing you how hard it could be, but I really. <laughs> yeah, you, yeah, you did. You did. <laughs> so, Sylvia was kind enough to, I was always curious about enameling and Sylvia was kind enough to spend a day with me. And I thought, this is so hard. I am never going to do it again, but I have a, I, ha I still have the piece. Uh, a oh, nice you do? Piece. Yeah. Yeah. I still have it. Yeah. So you, I, I learned a good lesson in many ways. That you weren't going to do it? Well, right. that's, that's too bad because I think you would have enjoyed it if you really did it. Maybe. Maybe we, you know, maybe we did something that was a little too meticulous to start with. Well, maybe. everybody has their, I think everybody has their meticulous, their areas where they can be meticulous and other times where they want to tear their hair out. Right. <laughs> so, you know. I mean, I, like for Sally, the way Sally does beating, I mean, oh, God, I would rather, I don't know, it's just impossible to think about it. But, 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 I'm, but I'm playing around with uh, tweezers and little pieces of paper, so that would drive someone else crazy. And I can't knit. And, and you know, everybody's got their thing. And uh, right. so you, you've really covered the gamut of, you know, it's great. Right. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. I love your work. You know that. <laughs> yeah, you're just a friend. You're a friend. You're always going to say that. That's not true. I just would not say it. Pat me on the head and send me on my way. You know. <laughs> <laughs> no, everybody that's watching knows your work, Nancy, and they know how good it is. Oh, you are so kind. Thanks. Yeah. Any, Any more questions? Not a question, but the work was just. Absolutely beautiful. Thank you so much. Lita, you sent me such a nice note. I told Lita that I was nervous about doing this talk. She said, you don't have to worry about the talk. People will like your work. <laughs> so everybody is so encouraging. That helps. I have a, a question. I'm in Susan's class with Ronnie and some other people. Uh -oh. And um, the work is wonderful. It's so wonderful to see and such a, just so much development of, you know, you just kept going and making more and more things. I was wondering specifically, I'm working with paper pulp, it just experimenting sort of mostly on my own, not entirely. Yeah. But I was wondering, how did you get, what kind of paint did you put in your blender? How, how did you get such saturated, beautiful colors? Uh, I've been painting on the outside after it dries, but you're you're putting no, no, no. I dye the pulp. I you dye, dye the pulp. it. I dye and the pulp. You... And I, what I started with was pails of white pulp, and each pail I put a different color. Dyed it with Prosian dyes that you dye fabric with. Ah, okay, that's and what then, And then if I wanted to mix colors, I mixed it the, the way you'd mix paints. Okay, and you put it right in the blender. Right. Yeah. But I didn't make all that pulp in the blender. I, I bought the pulp and then re, re wet it each time I needed to use it. Okay. You didn't have to put a, um, a mordant on that pulp. You just use the dyes right on it because when you use right. Procyon dyes on cotton fabric, you have to um, you have to treat the fabric first with soda ash so that it'll stick to the cotton. Right, right. And you don't need that for the paper pulp. I don't remember what I did. Yeah. Tell you the truth. And Sylvia, while I'm unmuted, fabulous, fabulous, and I would love to see more of that soft sculpture that you did. Did okay. you do more pieces than just those three? Oh yeah, I did, but yeah. I I sold some of them. So oh, good, even better. <laughs> yeah, I was fascinated with those because I'm I'm into fabric now. So I know you are mm -hmm. into so many wonderful things. Thanks. Appreciate the work. You mentioned having used oil-based paints for your uh, etchings and printing, but that they are the newer water-based ones. Stephanie Nevon Jacobson. Right. Right, As, and it's much healthier for you to use. Uh, so have you used those at no, all? No, I didn't. I, I wasn't, I actually was having allergic uh, reactions to the oil basing after a while, since the turpentine. And so I stopped doing it for a while and I went into other things. And in the meantime, 
they invented this water-based inks that work. So that's great. And they're totally non-toxic too. Right. Okay. So, so we, you, don't, you don't want to take lessons from me now. You have to take lessons from the people who are using safer chemicals. <laughs> Sylvia, do you use your press anymore? Have you used your press? In, in a little bit, a little bit. I don't We're, think I'll ever give it up. <laughs> great, yeah. You know, when I, when I finished the classes in printmaking, at that time there was no art league and there was no place else that I could print. So Julian said, okay, you're gonna get a press. And that was the greatest gift I could get. So I was mm -hmm. just so lucky. After a while, um, there was a studio by Ruth Leaf. I don't know if anybody ever heard of her. Mm -hmm. And she was in Great Neck and she gave, she'd written a book about printmaking and gave very good workshops. And some of my friends were able to go there. I was teaching, so I couldn't get there. And they would bring me the information that they learned from her. So she's no longer alive, but if you have to look on uh, the computer, you'll find some of her prints. They're wonderful. I have one sitting in my bedroom. <laughs> was she teaching at Cumberland School? No. No? no she, she had her own studio. That's where she was teaching. And you know, at that time, eventually, a lot more people became interested. It was the height of printmaking, I think. And we, our media group, printmaking was so large. I think every printmaker on the island joined us at that point because we were having exhibits and teaching each other. It was great. Uh, I guess you people didn't, weren't around at that time. Just me. <laughs> Sylvia, is there one, one memory of the, something from the Craft Guild that stands out to you over the years? One. There's lots of memories. At the very beginning of the craft school, first of all, everybody wanted to be president or wanted to be a nominee, believe it or not. And it was, <laughs> and it was a secret as to who was nominated. Really? Yeah. It was a big competition and everybody whispered, oh, he wants it, oh, she wants it, and they wouldn't tell. So you're in a very different position now than it was at that time. There were also many more men in the organization and they did, uh, there were potters, jewelers, but more men participated in it. I don't know what happened to them. Um, what the, and we had the wonderful picnics at this person's, what was the name of the people? The Dennings. The Dennings were people who did the huge enamels and they had a house, I don't remember where. Where was it, Ron? Do you remember? Uh, Mutton Town? Or was it? Uh -huh. Anyway, we'd go there, have a picnic, uh, swim in their pool or, or the, on the sound there. And that was fun. And we, we met, our kids met the, the kids of the other members of the guild. We got to people's houses that I never went to before. Um, and we had workshops for each other. I just want to say how wonderful it is to listen to all of you talk about how mentoring functions in the craft guild. And that that is really wonderful and rare. So, and it, it seems like it's um, the activity of the craft guild. So. I compliment all of you for sharing and uh, enjoying each other. Thank you. Well, now you're a member, you've been part of us. But we, uh, there's a group of us, we're in Brooklyn, so we can easily come to the meetings, but we, we attended all of the presentations and I'm so glad that they'll continue. And this was a wonderful one. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Just to remind everyone that our September meeting is the demo meeting and talk about sharing. We've had members who tried something at a September meeting and then just took it up and went 
went went with it. So we will have several members, as as always, demonstrating and either doing a hands-on thing or just just uh, showing the technique. And we're an educational group, so you don't have to consider yourself some great artist or craftsperson. Anyone can come. And that's been the role of the craft school, educating the communities to what crafts is. It's a very important role. I thoroughly enjoyed this presentation. I am so impressed with Sylvia's talent and just her whole persona. We spoke at length at the craft at the craft fair uh, last weekend, and I'm just so happy to be able to share this experience with you and all of you. Oh, thank, thank you. you. What a so lovely thing much. to say. What a lovely thing to say. Thank you. I appreciate it. Hi, Sylvia. It's Lisa. Hi, Lisa. <laughs> I don't want to ask a question. I just want to tell you that I loved it and it was very good. And people should only see all of your work because I'm blessed to get to see everything that Sylvia has made. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for all the help you give me. Lisa and Susan are my caretakers and they're there always helping me and encouraging me and wanting to go to the craft guild activities so there we are and can we say hello to ronnie and and judy just to thank them as, as well hi <laughs> oh there's my daughter judy hi judy hi mom <laughs> it was great really great i'm so glad you enjoyed you it did now very I, good. <laughs> I feel better about it <laughs> You know, there was a lot of behind the scenes work that, to make this happen between Nancy, the two Nancys, and practicing and, and taking photos and, and uh, um, Sylvia's daughters helping out. So it doesn't just happen. It no, happens. it doesn't. It yeah. doesn't. Alice, uh, about a year ago, this was your idea. You wanted me to do it, and I didn't know how I could do it. So you came up with this. So thank you. Thank you, everybody. Nancy encouraging me thanks sylvia i knew you were nervous but i'm i'm really glad you did it sylvia you're very easy to love <laughs> yeah that's true it's great for all those people that always wish they had a mother that would sort of like support them and do yeah, and didn't particularly do that so thank you sylvia you're yeah. my wife. i think i'm everybody's mother or grandmother <laughs> Thank you to everyone for being here. Be well, stay safe, and we'll see you May 25th at Sayasit Library.